I refer to myself sometimes as a simple counselor. Um, I'm a psychologist. Uh, I was ordained in 1999. If you can't hear me, if I'm talking too fast, do something so I catch your attention. I have a tendency to talk very fast at times as well. Usually I'm aware of it, but not always. Um, so right after I was ordained, I discovered in my home parish, as well as a parish that I was assigned, that two second grade kids were turned away in April from their May 1st communions. And it was because they were autistic. Well, my sense of social justice became so inflamed at that point that I didn't think that this was a proper thing. Well, those of you that attended Mark Shriver's talk uh, may have heard him reference his mother a little bit and Pittsburgh at one point. Well, the Pittsburgh connection there was Grace Harding, our Director of Disabilities. She was the one that created the Rose Kennedy curriculum uh, for mentally retarded, as it was referred to then. Uh, it's a wonderful curriculum. It's a bit dated. Um, and it really doesn't address all of the needs of autism very well, but it was a wonderful starting point. And so Grace and I had very good discussions. Um, she retired a year after I met her. She had gave me the curriculum, and she didn't tell me she was retiring, and she basically patted me on my back and said, good luck. <laughs> uh, so I waited a couple of years for the diocese to help, and they really didn't. Uh, so I ended up beginning with the program. Um, I, as I said, I'm a psychologist. I, uh, I work in the field of autism. I'm the ma I manage the, the western half of Pennsylvania. We have an adult autism waiver. Uh, so I know a lot about it. It seems like I live it because I do it in so much of my life. Um, but how I look at it is look at it in a different way. Uh, I'm going to say some things today that may challenge a lot of the traditional catechists here because I do things very differently. Um, so be prepared to either be angry at me or say, that's an interesting idea. Um, I use teenagers as my catechists. Uh, to start with. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, and I'll get to it in a second. But I have a program. Let me tell you about the program in a nutshell, and then I'll go through my slides a bit, and then we can stop and talk for a bit. Uh, I have a program that meets uh, every Sunday. We started this about 10 years ago. Uh, we meet early in the morning, Sunday mornings at 8.30. Uh, my catechists are teenagers. Uh, they range in age from typically from 9th grade to 12th grade, but I have a couple 6th and 7th graders. They're paired with older kids. Um, I'm also the board president of the National Apostolate for Inclusion Ministry. So why am I using teenagers and why do I use them one-to-one -one and talking about inclusion in the same sentences? Well, let me tell you. Um, in terms of inclusion, my idea is that if I only get 40, 45 minutes an hour a week to prepare somebody for religion, uh, to prepare them to learn our sacraments, and to make them as ready as possible to enter our Catholic Church as adults, I want to take as much advantage of that as I can. Now, those of you that may know something about autism will know that that fan that's in the background could be very distracting to some people. Um, it's very distracting to me. I get sensitive to noises. Every time I walk in front of this light, that bright light is very distracting to me. The light coming through the window um, when the door's open, um, sometimes when the sign moves. Um, it's distracting to me. Uh, any type of distraction for somebody with autism may be a source of a uh, thing that's going to break their concentration on what they're trying to learn. So if you can imagine, there's some very good ideas that I've heard, very good curriculums that I've seen, but it's the application of the curriculums that I get a little bit concerned about. Uh, if you don't pay attention to some of the things that are important for somebody who's autistic, you may have the best of curriculum, the best of work, but if you can't deliver it, it's not really doing its purpose very well because these kids are so easily distracted. So what I do is I basically, um, I force parents to come, force them to bring their kids, so they've got to sit there, and I have teenagers work one-to-one -one with these students. There's lots of room up here too, if you'd like. Um, let me go into my slides a little bit. Sorry, I'm gonna have to go be up and behind you now and again. That's good. Let me tell you a little bit of story about Michael first, and I'll tell you the programs. This will give you a little bit of a philosophy about what I think about it. Michael was a, a boy that uh, has an extraordinarily slow processing. In Pennsylvania, uh, if you have a disability, you're eligible for Medicaid-related services that if you get a psychologist like me that uh, can do an evaluation and write a prescription, you can get services to come to your home or into your school to help support you in that program. Michael was one of these children that got these services. When he went to his home school district, a very good school district, um, they said he's mentally retarded. You know, we need to put you into life skills. 
is essentially what they told the family. Parents said, no, we don't think so. We don't want him to go there. He didn't really talk until he was eight or nine years old. Um, I knew that because I evaluated the kid since he was six years old. Well, his father knew that I got involved with this program uh, right along with this, and I would do the evaluations. I would tell him about this. He was Catholic, but he didn't come to church, and he didn't bring his child to any kind of catechesis. Um, if you'd see uh, Michael, when he got to the room, whenever he would get upset and people didn't hear him or understand him, he would do things that would get your attention. He would bang his head off the table when he got mad. He was very disruptive to the classrooms, but his family, you know, his family did not want him to go to any kind of a special class. Um, he would sometimes punch himself in the face. So I knew this about him. Um, sometimes he would stim a little bit, but it was really more the punching in the face that would get the attention. So I finally did talk to his family about coming in and considering the program. And how the program was with him, he, by the time he came in, he was 14, but he's a big boy. At that point, he was six foot two, maybe 250, something of that nature. I paired him with a ninth grade um, Catholic school girl from one of our high schools, uh, Beth, uh, who couldn't have been 85 pounds. She had a little tiny thing, so the, the difference between the two was quite noticeable. Well, Michael was surprised that he was, you know, was with a girl to start with because he doesn't talk very well with anybody, but particularly somebody from the opposite sex. Uh, but with Beth ended up asking him shortly on in the first class. He was 14, he hadn't received First Communion, he hadn't received his confession. We decided we were gonna talk about reconciliation, second or third class in. So Dad and I are just kind of standing close by because it was finally we got him there. And so he go, uh, Beth goes and asks him, well, we're, today we're gonna talk about sin. We're gonna talk about reconciliation. And he says, you mean about sin? She says, yeah. She says, you mean like Cain and Abel? She says, yeah. Well, Dad and I just kind of started looking at each other. And Beth, of course, didn't know any better because she didn't know him from anywhere. And she says, yeah, about Cain and Abel. He went on to tell us a story about Cain and Abel. Uh, this boy didn't talk until he was nine years old. His dad looked at me afterwards um, and said, I don't know where he got this story from. We've never taken him into religious education. Um, you know, I, we don't talk to him about that. Where would he pick up you know, this particular story from? I had never heard him say a full sentence. You know, I do these evaluations for him for years. Uh, here he is at 14. He will give me a word or two. Here's this pretty little girl, and he's given this whole story. You know, there was a lot of interesting dynamics that were going on uh, throughout this. Let's see what I'm missing. Now he's 15. All right, well. Um, I guess the point that I made to his family, and I'll, I'll give you another good example in a second, is we don't know what they know. Things go in, but because it's a processing disorder, you know, I have to hear what you're saying, I have to understand it, process it, and oftentimes I have to come back out with a response. With Michael, it takes a very long time. I've worked with Michael for a lot of years. Uh, even after he left the program and he was, received his confirmation eventually, he was involved <coughs> in another program that I run, and you would ask him a question. And if you gave him enough time, I, I can't do it, it takes too long, uh, he gives like five to eight to 12 seconds before he would respond back. But if you give him enough time, he will give you back a nice, thorough um, answer that's very concrete but very complete. He would think things through. When we gave him that time, he was very clear that he was a very bright kid. He can't take conventional tests. Now here's another young man I want to tell you about that I think will illustrate that a little bit better. Greg is a young man that um, when he was coming into school age education, which was around five or six years of age for him, they did an initial intelligence test. It was considered value or, uh, valid by a certified school psychologist. An IQ of 64 is a score in the mid-range of the mild mental retardation range. He could have qualified for life skills. His family said no as well to that. When he got to be about um, into early high school, before he was 17 years of age, because Social Security entitlements allow you to qualify based upon a certain number, they redid another IQ test, a different psychologist, um, a different test because of his age. It came up with 72. Certainly it's in the range of that. It's a little bit higher. It's a standard deviation, almost that much higher, but the interesting one is the one that when he ended up going to OVR. Now, my, uh, that's a score in the average range. Had they put him in life skills, the kid would have gone crazy because it wouldn't have been stimulating enough for him to do that. And again, what I, my understanding of it is, is that he became more efficient at processing that information. What he heard, what he saw, he was able to understand it better and produce back what I needed to have on my intelligence test for it. 
it's really hard to know. When I do in services for school psychologists, for example, I say, you know, although I'm a certified school psychologist, I'm really glad I don't do that work anymore uh, because you have to be very vigilant because that, those windows open and process very fast. And so somebody that may be at this level right now, two years from now, they may have begun to process it more efficiently. You need to keep up with it so that they're actually stimulated properly. I say this kind of information to you because it's very difficult because they don't give you a lot of information back. You know, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get back from someone because they don't like to look at you. You know what eye contact is? Is I look at each of you and look in your eyes. You know, that's an intimate type of contact with somebody. It's very difficult to do uh, because I worked at a school, and I can say this in this room, I, I won't get chewed out too much. Uh, I worked at a school that taught oral deaf, and so we learned a speech read. And so what I teach kids to do, or what I teach my consumers to do, <coughs> is I teach them to speech read. If we hold things up towards their face, they get to see it, what the object is. They get to see how I actually pronounce things or say things. They're speech reading me. So their clarity, their understanding is much more clear. But if I teach them to look at your lips, that's not nearly as intimate as your eyes. They can't tell emotions very good. So through little gimmicks like that, they're acknowledging you when you talk, but they're not necessarily having that very hard um, emotional context of looking at somebody's eyes. Does that make sense to everyone? I think that there's lots of Michaels and Gregs in the world. Um, one doesn't really know what one knows. Um, you kind of have to, to keep going even though you're not getting much of the feedback. Oh, I wrote some interesting things. It's <coughs> we'll get through part of this. I'm never going to get through all of them, but um, I'm going to skip that. I think probably the most interesting thing there is Cardinal Royal, when he was bishop at Pittsburgh, was the one who ordained me. Um, I do a lot of variations of things. He wanted some interesting stories. I'll be going back to Lagos in a couple of weeks. Um, you talk about autism in Nigeria. You talk about autism in places and how it's not diagnosed or developmental disabilities. When I was there last March, this is kind of just an aside from this, uh, autism's everywhere. Um, I don't know what causes it. It just seems to be prevalent. Uh, we, we went on basically a mission. Uh, there's uh, six of us from Pittsburgh that go. Um, we saw all kinds of developmental things that I have only read about in textbooks. I saw children with um, elongated heads, um, various, so we'll go on, but, uh, various forms of things because they don't necessarily know what to do even if they do identify it. Um, CDC estimates right now one in 88 children are now identified um, as having autism. Uh, if the diagnosis, if one's looking for it, one can actually diagnose it as early as 12 to 18 months of age. Um, or typically it's closer to between two and three years if you have people that understand how to um, diagnose it. Kim, would you add anything to that? Is that close? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple of studies that will actually say it's a little bit younger if you're trained, some of the San Diego studies, but um, again, uh, but it follows a, uh, by definition, and I'll go through this in much more detail if we have time towards the end of the talk, uh, about what makes up a diagnosis. But you, in order to be diagnosed with autism, you have to meet basically three criterion. There has to be a language impairment. Language is impaired in some fashion. You're not speaking on time. You don't understand necessarily what you're saying. Parents are repeatedly rephrasing or restating sentences. So there's a language delay or language impairment. There's problems with socialization and the various aspects of knowing how to play, knowing how to engage in play, knowing how to do things with others, um, knowing boundaries. If I go up to somebody because I like something and I, I, you're good, you're good, I'm not going to knock everything over. If I get this close, I make people nervous and people respond to it. They don't necessarily recognize when boundaries are there because it's, they want what they want and they don't recognize it. Or I might say something is, you know, why are you wearing that cross? Isn't that more like, don't women wear necklaces? <laughs> um, and they'll say it very bluntly to you. Well, it's a deacon cross, so he's a deacon, so I can say that and tease him. <coughs> um, but things of that nature, they don't necessarily understand that. All right. I told you my story about the two little kids in 2003. Um, this is basically my philosophy in terms of if you only get an hour a week and you only have that amount of time, you know, my notion by doing this particular program is that by the time somebody is ready to be confirmed, if you can go through traditional uh, education that way, I want them to be as prepared as possible to join our Catholic community to the best level as possible. So that's my inclusion. That's where I actually make it to where I want you to be meaningfully included. 
There are a lot of good things that you can do in a group, but because of all the distractions and the various types of stimulation that will keep them from learning, I want to teach one-on-one -on -one while I have you in that opportunity to best do it, even though we do some things in groups. And I'll explain some of those things as we go. You're allowed to talk and ask questions or challenge me with things. I'm going to skip that. Program begins um, even as early as preschool, depending upon the levels. Um, you know, I know this is an old saying at this point, but if you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. The variations are so different from each other. You know, I'll have, I have a mom that came in. Um, I'll use this as an example. She drives to my class 35 miles on Sunday morning to be there at 8.30. Um, one of her boys um, is what would be considered Asperger's. Somebody with an IQ, his IQ is actually well above 110, I'm sure. Um, but high function is considered an IQ of 84 or greater. Um, it's like, well, 84 or greater. Her other son um, is very likely um, to be mentally retarded um, in that range. He just doesn't process it. Um, they're as different from each other that way as they can be, but they're a year apart from each other. So they come into the program. Well, I begin my program with kids that young, and depending upon where they're at and whether or not they have language, I'm using a lot of Genesis in my first two years of my program as we put it together. Uh, it's a very easy way to start. I'll give you examples of the specific lessons in a little bit, but then this is kind of uh, the format that I, I try to follow. There's an interesting example that happens after. I'll give you a, an aside right now for a second, but after confirmation, these kids that have been there for four or five years now, that becomes their social group. They actually now develop <coughs> relationships with some of the people there, and as a result, they didn't want to stop coming. Curiously, several of the kids now, I've had three of them that have come back to be teachers themselves, um, two of them with Asperger's, one of them with not such high, very high functioning form of autism, have come back and either acted as a teacher themselves or acted as a teacher's aide for other kids with autism. Um, it's kind of curious, but it was because of the social context. They got used to coming Sundays. They got used to coming to see the same kids. They got used to having typical teenagers treating them like friends. This is what ended up happening over the course of time. Another aside, if you don't mind. Um, my parents, when they began to see this, you've got to understand, I have a group of parents that have been hurt by the church at some level. Um, you know, I'll tell you that in a second. So they're sitting there, they, I have a process group going from them at the same time. We started out in a very large library, and so I'd have scattered around where it could be at least quiet in the beginning, the class is going on. So the parents could watch the kids uh, working one-to-one -one with the teenager. They're watching them learning. They're watching their kids actually do things. They're watching their kids come back with either the social stories that they've written out, uh, the picture, religious picture stories, or sometimes crafts. So they're watching these non-educated teenagers teach their kids religion. Um, and they said, this is wonderful, I want to do more. And that's the part where I get suckered in all the time. Um, things like uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins, we have a hockey team in Pittsburgh. Um, Sidney Crosby gives me his um, box to use a couple of times a year. It's a 12-seat box. And what I end up doing, the first year that I got the tickets for the, the games twice a year, um, I used to bring children with autism and their parents. And after the first game, I thought, this is really stupid kick the parents out. And so I have the autistic children come and I have their teachers. Um, so I have neurotypicals. And it was really interesting, if I can pretend to sit for a second. Uh, one of the, the, when the Penguins went to the playoffs uh, to go into the Stanley Cup one year, a couple of years ago, I had one boy with Asperger's come in. Um, it was his first game that he attended. That was a game when Pittsburgh played Philadelphia. They scored six or seven goals that game and that clinched it to go in. The entire arena was just really crazy with people jumping and screaming. Even though we were in this little box, they could see everything. Here's this boy sitting in his chair, just kind of watching. He's moving. He's very mechanical. People around him are all crazy with their things. I brought him back to a game the next season. Uh, at that time, I could take him to two games. Um, brought him back. You couldn't have picked him out from anybody. What taught me in that instance was, and again, you know, I do this for a living. I didn't even recognize it. What I'd learned from that kid was that you have to teach them how to have fun in different settings. They actually don't know that um, in many regards. I mean, I know it's common sense at this point to me, um, but new situations that they're exposed to, there's new sets of rules that go with it. So you have to understand then how to have fun in this situation. 
you know, if you're with people that you don't necessarily know, I've got to observe what everybody does. I've got to observe all the people around me in order to have fun. With the parents, they don't let you off. Because if you start doing this with them, be prepared because they're going to ask you to do other things. So I started with the Penguins. I ended up with a Boy Scout Venture Group. Um, so we try to do monthly outings. It's a photography group. Uh, we go to places periodically. Um, it's hard to get the teenagers, the neurotypicals, to go with us because you've got to find things that are just schedules are so busy. You know, the one nice thing about 8.30 Sunday mornings, they're sleeping. I mean, I'm not really competing much more. Um, and the example that I use with the teens at that age, you know, what teenagers get up at 8.30 in the morning, you know, especially as the school year goes along, there's dances or late night dates or whatever. Um, I had one boy that came that uh, his mother basically forced him. It was like she was pushing his arm behind his back. His younger brother was, had Asperger's and she says, this is something you need to do. So very reluctantly, he started to come as a teacher. I don't typically like to take kids that are forced, but you know, this was early on in the program. Third class, he's with a little peanut. This little boy, all he wanted to do was show a picture of his dog. Um, and Daniel was having a hard time getting him to focus. Um, after that third class, um, he must have said something. This little boy grabbed him around his leg with both arms and just hugged him. He just wouldn't let him go. The kid melted. It just became so close for him. <coughs> that was his reason from that point on. You know, he was a sucker for any of, this, any of the things the kid did. He's very creative, too. What I find is a lot of these teens can do things that I would never thought of. In this particular situation, what he would do is that he took a, he, drew picture stories um, of the parables. And in every parable, believe it or not, there happened to be a dog. And that dog in every one of those parables happened to be this little boy's dog's name. That kid <laughs> paid full attention to it. I mean, he was able, that was the gimmick that kept him there. Um, I wouldn't have thought of that, at least not right away. Um, and that's what he did. So my lessons are taught one-to-one -one with these teenagers. I do an orientation before we start every year. Um, it's especially good for the new kids but it's um, anybody that wants to keep coming back. But it's just to give the basics of what autism is and what it isn't. It's a basic 101 autism course. It's fairly simple, it's a half a day. I can generally get them for that much. What I like to use as much though are the learning moments that come into a regular classroom. One of those good learning moments, one year it was very hot in Catholic schools, which is where I do mine, typically don't have air conditioning, at least not in Pittsburgh. So this was a pretty warm place. They had floor fans. And autistic kids, a lot of times, like things that spin. Uh, this little boy was very active, very fast. Uh, he loved the fans. And before I knew what was going on, he went right over and he turned his fan on. So I'm there right behind him and I shut it off. He's quick. Every fan on that damn floor, excuse me, um, he had turned on. And here's the deacon chasing him around this whole floor. Uh, the kids loved it. I mean, the teenagers just, just loved it. But that's learning moments. We talked about stimming and what stimming means. And when you get those opportunities to talk about it, it really becomes very concrete when you see something. When you see somebody running around and moving, um, you talk about what it's trying to do. If you see somebody starting to stim, it may be because they're upset or maybe because they're really excited. If you're really excited but you don't have words to say what you want to say, it's got to come out some way. When I talk from the pulpit sometimes, when I talk to my congregation, you know, I talk about what stimming is. You know, you hear these noises behind you, but if you get real excited because that stained glass is coming through our window and it's really bright with all these colors, you're very excited, you want to say something. Sometimes it's because the, the preacher is really boring, and so they start making noises. Their behaviors usually are their form of communication, and you've got to recognize that it's not to be disruptive, it's not to be oppositional to you, it's that something's not clicking correct. You may not be able to figure it out right away, but it's their form of communication for it. Nine times out of 10, or maybe 19 out of 20 times out of 20, um, it's not oppositional. It's really that they just don't get something. When that boy was you know, uh, banging his head off the chair, off the table, it was because he was upset at something. He couldn't get his words out quick enough before that teacher moved on. You know, he was trying to say, slow down. As he got more articulate and comfortable with me, I start every one of my classes off you know, with, um, right before we dismiss and go off to our various rooms, we do a simple prayer. In the beginning, I used to try to use a children's lectionary for the reading of the day. That's too long. Um, so I, would, I thought about using prayers. The Our Father, that's too long for all the kids that are there. That's my one group activity. We use the Hail Mary. I must say the Hail Mary way too fast. I'm saying it as slow as I can possibly say it, but it was too fast for him. And halfway through it all the time, slow down, Dr. Sutton, slow down. Um, he wasn't talking that fast, but I mean, that's how he would get up and he would stand and he would push down like this to slow me down. 
um, because his processing was that slow. But at least he could use words at that point to slow me down a little bit because he wanted to participate with the group that way. And when he was in his one-to-one -one lesson, he did just fine, and that teacher knew it. She didn't care. She was communicating to him, and she was giving him got good feedback. All right. You can see some of my picture taking. I've got to open the door, and what's at stake, of course, is um, heaven. Who is impacted? There's lots of people that are impacted by the program. And then with each of these people are various responsibilities. With this paper that I showed you in the beginning, uh, if somebody were to write me a note, an email, to ask me about how to work with this situation, I'd write out these very elaborate emails. I get tons of emails. And it was getting long. So I eventually joined the National Apostolate for Inclusion Ministry thinking, okay, there's an organization, and it is, that we can get some of it out. <coughs> but it's still, finally, I, I met somebody and basically worked with Loyola Press um, because it was hard. And, you know, I'm doing this variation of a program, and they've invited me in, and they said, okay, we like your curriculum, your way of doing things, but before we're going to do that, I want you to write a book. And last summer, that's what this was. So they asked me last summer if I put together a book which talks about the method that I have um, been talking to you about today. Um, it gives some of the story, it gives a lot of the stories, but it gives the particulars on how to put the thing together just so that I can have a frame of reference to go from, if that makes any sense. So that's why this is here. Um, everybody has a role. Everybody has a responsibility. Um, the kids with autism, they know their protocol. I made a mistake once. Um, we began using songs this year for the first time. Songs are okay. Music is a nice thing. Um, you're not necessarily going to teach new information, uh, but whatever your routine is, it really can't change week to week. Things need to be done in a certain way. Well, beginning by the song, I got lost in terms of what my protocol typically was, and I forgot to Hail Mary. One of my kids that had been there since his fifth year went down and had a meltdown. A kid that's been very successful because I, for, I didn't know it. I didn't know what was going on. I knew him very well because I've known him for a long time. His mom came up to me and you know, said, Hail Mary, we got it. I finally got him settled down after I dismissed the rest of the group, um, but he's the one that I'd have to make sure, and I would never have guessed that this child was so rigid on it that he had to have that because I skipped it. It didn't matter that it was, would have been a little bit later, but it's a fact that I was missing it altogether. So the routine that we follow with the children is really important. Anybody have any ideas as to why the routines are so important? If there's a two hour snow delay in school, why? Is everybody else happy, but these guys are really upset? The, the, um, the routine is very important. They want to be able to um, have things that they can depend on. Correct. If you can't predict the future, this is the executive functioning, the executive dysfunction. They can't really, every situation that's new is a new situation, so they don't know what to expect from it. Um, and so if a class is now shortened, you know, their whole way of understanding what's to come next is going to be disrupted. So now they've got to worry about everything that's going to go on with them during the day. Um, it's very predictable then that that's going to be a very bad day for them. Um, so it's very important that routine, at least fairly closely, is followed. Children's families, they have a part of this. You know, I had one father that had me on trial for the first two years. Didn't know I was on trial. This was a story. This is, um, you're the only other clerk that's here, so I can say this, but um, the pastor in this particular church did something perfectly by accident, but his dad was um, upset. His, his, he has two autistic children. Uh, one of his boys was making lots of noise, and the usher came up to him and said, I don't want you to come back. Why, why don't you take care of your son? Can't you go back to the cry room? Well, he became real upset at that, so he didn't come back. He'd been gone almost two months. He came back again. The pastor came up to him and said, you know, <coughs> it's nice to see you back. I noticed that you weren't here. Before he got a chance to say why he wasn't coming, the pastor said, you know, I know because I didn't see your envelopes in the collection. He went crazy. Well, this, is, this was the priest's idea. He knew it just because he didn't actually look for him every Mass, but that was his way of knowing because his name wasn't there. But, of course, Dad thought that all you want is my money. So he went crazy. Well, this guy told me this uh, towards the end of his second year, and he said he wanted to know if this was for real or if you were just trying to game me on something. People have agendas because people have been hurt and one has to be aware as to what the motivation is. 
early on, and you know, I'm a, I'm a counselor type, so uh, I wanted the parents there for a reason. I wanted to be able to allow them to talk about the church if they had problems. I wanted them also to see that they weren't by themselves, so we had that going at the same time as well. Um, but what emerged was some of these horror stories of what you know, basically they were exposed to, but it gave them a chance to get it off their chest. But ironically, what ended up happening is that some of these parents became Eucharistic ministers. Some of them became more involved in the parish in other ways all of a sudden. Some of them, and this particular guy, it's very hard to get him involved in things because he's very short-tempered, um, but he's still involved now. He's, at least when he's upset with something, he tells you about it right away and he doesn't hold it in. So that's an improvement. Um, but there are agendas. and. Now that my group now has 25 kids, um, which means I have 25 children with autism or some developmental disability, 25 sets of parents, 25 sets of teenagers. I've got a lot of people coming in for a small program. I can't do the parents group by myself. One of my teenagers' parents happens to be a counselor from one of the agencies in our local area. She facilitates my group while our daughter is actually teaching one of the little kids, uh, which has worked out well. It's turned out to be a very useful uh, part of the program to have that. I've jumped around lots of ways, but can I ask you if you have an idea of what my program is right now or ask questions about it? Because <coughs> I'll start going other ways. Go. Um, you've given examples where you've got um, where your class, you have a class full of autistic kids. Um, I have situations where uh, one or two of my kids out of, out of say, 12, uh, may have autism, and so I tend to present the material in, in a variety of different ways, just depending on which which right. method is best you know, best for that child. Um, I guess that's the question: Is is there any way of? of I have uh, not found any, okay. and this is me. This is me, not any publisher or anything else. I found that if I only have this amount of time to work with these kids, and I get them theoretically between first or second grade whenever they come in and you know eighth grade I only have a little bit of time to teach them about God to teach them about our church to prepare them for confirmation and if I have that much time only that much <coughs> not counting the communication issues that are involved I'm going to take that and work them one-to-one -one because there's also other things that occur with that look what happens to the teenagers you know by them taking these lessons that I'm giving them they're having to relearn the material. So you think, oh, I'm done with confirmation in our diocese. Anyhow, once I'm confirmed, I'm done with religion or CCD. I don't have to go back anymore. Well, they're reviewing these lessons, and not only are they looking at those lessons, but they have to rewrite them so that their child can understand them. So they're actually you know, learning yeah. more themselves, which is a wonderful thing um, to get them prepared. But I find that doing it one-to-one -one is the only way that I can do that. I, the, the distractions, when you get somebody that begins to have a meltdown, somebody begins to flap, that's distracting to everybody else that's in the group. So I'll do an initial opening exercise with everyone, but then I'll dismiss them for the bulk of the class. And they do their one-to-one -one lesson from there. Um, you have to be careful of the classrooms. This is a perfect classroom. There's nothing in it. There's a crucifix, uh, but there's basically nothing on the walls. There's no colors. This is a good thing except for the sound. But otherwise, it's good. You know, I, I naively thought in the beginning, and you learn from going through the mistakes that you do. Um, we were in the nursery area. I started in the library with four or five kids in the beginning. That's easy. You know, we could put them at different tables and watch what goes on. It was fairly quiet. When I started to get to 12 people, I had to go to other classrooms because it was just too big and kids were making too much noise with each other. Uh, I was on the nursery floor. We have a wonderful nursery room with a great big castle in it. And I thought, well, that's all right. The kids, they couldn't pay attention to religion. That was too interesting. Uh, you're competing with the stuff that's in there. One of the other rooms had a great big Lego block area. I don't know how they could teach regular school in this because it was very <laughs> distracting. But again, we couldn't use those types of classrooms because they were just too stimulating. Uh, so we had to go to the ones that were more traditional classrooms to keep them into it. Um, Yes, ma'am. How do you get controlling her parents to trust the teens? Because from what I gather, then you would prefer that the teens work one on one with the child. And there are parents who just like don't want to let go. And um, I'll just give your name to them and say that you said it's okay. Uh, you can do that, but I mean, that's the rules. You know, the kids have to follow the rules. If you want to come into this program, I only have a couple basic rules. And one of the rules is that the teenager, after every class, has to give the parent a homework assignment. Believe it or not, that's hard. Teens don't want to talk to these adults, even though they're working with the kids. But 
you know, I try as hard as I can that way. But they, whatever lesson they review, I want the parent to review it at least once during the upcoming week so that you can build from that to go on to the next lesson. You're right, that's a very hard thing, but that's, that's part of the rules. They have to do it um, because they're choosing to come in. That's how this is set up. I mean, if you want it, it's been successful now. We have, you know, many, many kids have received the Eucharist. I have um, my sixth and seventh kids are being confirmed this year. Um, a lot of kids have gone through the program and it, it's working, so. How do you um, pair up the kids with the teenagers? Is it by gender or by? That's the part that it's, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it is a lot of the Holy Spirit, but um, many of the children, at least initially, were kids that I had assessed. So I knew the kids fairly well, and I knew a lot of the teenagers. So the personality stuff, a lot of it's good guesses. Um, you know, that relationship, as I described the one boy in the beginning, you know, you don't give him any guys. It's mostly girls that are the teachers. Um, but the guys that you get, do get, you want to try to pair with kids that really need the, the role models in particular, because it's hard to get that type of thing happening. Yes. Their teachers, their aides are all female. Yes. Um, but you try to just make that type of guess, and you watch how their teaching styles are. The most important thing isn't, you know, how they got on initially in the beginning. It's the communication style. You know, I've had some teachers. I had one young woman. She was marvelous. She could teach any CCD. She, she was a homeschooler. Uh, she knew her religion extraordinarily well, but she spoke it and she didn't use the crafts or she didn't use the social stories. And if you're processing oral language like that, that auditory processing problem that these kids had was very difficult for them to really understand. Um, so I had to move her to somebody that could, more like someone with Asperger's, someone that could keep up with, even with slower down, she could do that. But she was conveying it too much verbally as a traditional teacher would, rather than how one would do it with. And that's the only exception I've had so far, knock on wood. Everybody else has really been, they like the social stories. They like making the pictures because they draw the pictures out, even though they may not be very good. The child then colors them in, or they do crafts. I had one little kid there with very little language. Um, it was Advent, we're trying to teach it. He didn't have much concepts. Well, um, his teacher who ended up actually going right through college, right through Duquesne University as a special education teacher, um, she made this wonderful Advent wreath. And I can still remember Cody coming up to me, taking me by the hand and taking me to where the, the flame was, put my hand there and pulling it real back real quick, <coughs> saying hot. He got the concept because of the cleverness of that particular teacher. You know, the ideas that some of them come up, I have one kid, I, I guess it was one of the earlier groups we were in, very fast, you couldn't get him to concentrate for anything. Um, for whatever reason, this kid used a whiteboard, his teacher. Um, whiteboard to me is very boring. He would, he would draw things on there, his lessons, again, words. Well, this kid's real smart with Asperger's, but he, I know you're not supposed to uh, diagnose ADHD at the same time, but I can't imagine that the two aren't there. With that whiteboard, he sat, and he would participate. The, the, kid would, the teacher would write things, he would write back on it. Where the ideas come from, I don't really get. You know, I give the lessons, I supervise it. You know, that connection there was magic because nobody else could work with him. He was just too quick and he wanted to fool around too much and he couldn't concentrate. He's the one, if you ever come to my mass at 9.30, you'll see running, because he'll, you know, he's third grade. <coughs> you'll still see him running up towards the altar. His mother's got to grab him back. His little sister's not quite as active, but she's also autistic. Poor mom's got her hands full with things. Um, all right. We practice, I'm way off my stuff and I'm never going to get to finish. What time am I going to? 40. Mm, we're going to talk fast then. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you about rituals a little bit. Rituals need to be practiced. Um, receiving uh, First Communion. Um, beginning January every year, I use non consecrated host, non consecrated wine. Um, <coughs> I have my teenagers act as um, Eucharistic ministers, and we practice the sequence. In the very beginning, uh, I, I begin in January because I want to go a couple weeks so that they can see it. I stop in February, we begin again in March, because I don't want to overload them with it. They look at that host, they take a bite, they sniff it. Um, again, the little boy that took my hand towards the flame was real interesting when he got to the wine, because I had a nice, I had one of the chalices. He swished it around, he smelled it, looks just like grape Kool-Aid. He took, a, it wasn't much in it, but he took a great big swig. He spat it all over the floor, because it didn't taste like Kool-Aid. In my classroom, who cares? It was linoleum floor. It wasn't a big deal. He never, um, but if he would have done that in church, that'd have been really a big catastrophe there. When they actually go in, they actually do the ritual far better than most of the people that I distribute communion to. 
They know how to bow. They know what a regular uh, bow is. They don't do the profound bow with these little chicken things uh, that I sometimes they, uh, they do it exactly correctly. This little boy that spat the wine, you know, he'll go and he gets actually a low gluten host. He'll do that. He'll go also over to, to receive the wine. His arms come up real quick like this because he wants the blessing from the minister as we give there. Um, but he'll never touch the wine again, I'm sure. But the, the advantage of doing them, practicing the rituals, is that you really get an idea uh, of what they need to do. Uh, we do it a little bit with confirmation. That's done more one-to-one -one and not in a group. I have everybody do it each week. We practice uh, communion because I want them to, again, get used to the style. One quick story about um, just the process that we go through to um, <laughs> teach the Mass. Um, your example in the beginning, uh, you know, late at the end, I, I think the Mass is really hard to sit through. There are a lot of things that aren't predictable, not the least of which is the guy that does the sermon um, that could be really interesting, it could be really boring, or it could be really long. Um, so it's hard. But what you can do is take pieces. And this is more the psychology part, but through a series of, I had a mom come, this mom with the two little kids came in the beginning and said, all I want to do is go to Mass. Um, it's all I want to ever be able to do is just be able to sit through it. I told her, I said, if you give me a year, you know, <laughs> if you trust me that much, give me a year, we'll go to Mass. We'll be able to have you there. What I did was I had them for the first four or five weeks um, just stay uh, until the announcements started at the beginning of Mass. And I said, you, you should go then. And she did, she did that. Uh, the next four or five weeks, they stayed until the first song was done. Then they left. Uh, and it went on and on through the uh, liturgy of the Word. Um, they left before the sermon. The sermon was really hard to get them through that piece. Uh, it took almost six months to get them through the sermon because it was so unpredictable. Once we got through there, the rest of it actually went fairly fast. It ended up taking me closer to 18 months. Uh, they're there every week. Uh, the kids receive a low gluten host uh, that's big in Pittsburgh. Um, he's, uh, but they know the, the protocol is just fine. And this is a boy with Asperger's and another boy with much more severe autism uh, that they come each week. The things can be done, but you need to understand who it is that you're working with. You need to understand the families, their willingness to work. Um, communication is really the key. You need to understand how these children un understand. You know, I think the cutest <laughs> thing is when we practice reconciliation, um, get nonverbal kids. How could they possibly go through reconciliation, you might think? Well, you know, you look at the behaviors that they do bad. You ask mom and dad, you know, tell me the things that you'd like them to stop. Are they punching their brother? Are they, um, you know, leaving their clothes on the floor? You get them to give you the list of what they would consider sins or bad things, and you get the, the list of things that are good. Well, you make little cards, picture cards, that represent it. Uh, what are the things that, you know, you've done that hurt God? What well, are these sins? And you teach them that association. Uh, what I do after I teach them, or I have the um, students teach them that, I have them then teach the priest. And that's the coolest part, is this priest is very tolerant with me, my pastor, is that he has the teenagers actually let them, in front of the kid, um, teach him how they communicate with each other. And then he takes them into the confessional. And they've been successful that way. So the teenagers are actually teaching the priest how to communicate with these kids um, so that they can successfully do it. It's worked is all I can suggest. Uh, there's a whole lot more to it, and I talk way more than I'm allotted time.